Hello everybody, I'm glad to see you again. Um, my name is Sergey and I am host for today's session. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much that uh, you find the time to join us today. Uh, I would like to note that today's session will be recorded and you'll be able to see it after session ends. And also you have a great ability to post your questions into the chat that uh, uh, our speaker, Veronica, will answer at the end of her presentation. So don't worry, everything will be okay. And uh, let me start with presenting, with presenting our speaker, Veronica, who started her career back in 2010. Uh, she worked uh, in three countries, in Belarus and Poland, and now she's working in USA. And uh, she had a lot of great experience that she would like to share with you. So Veronica, back to you. Hello. Uh, hi, guys. I'm really excited to present uh, on this conference and I'm really grateful to the organizers that put a lot of work and today. Well, first of all, it's community driven event. So in the first place, let's get a lot of fun. Let's exchange some knowledge expertise. So today I'm presenting uh, the following topic. It says 10 years in QA, 10 lessons learned. Uh, so basically, I encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like. You can disagree, you can comment, right? You can reach out uh, after the event. But in the first place, let's have fun and enjoy this 40 minutes of my talk. And after that, we'll have some time for the Q&A session, right? So pleasure to be here, really excited, and uh, please enjoy the talk. So basically, um, I would like to talk about the lessons that I've learned during these 10 years in QA. Um, so I started working in Belarus, then I worked in Poland and US. I worked for various projects and uh, for various customers. And the most sophisticated ones were in financial industry. And you know, in financial industry, you can't actually make a lot of mistakes, right? Um, a lot of money at stake. So your product should be reliable and you should be 100% confident uh, in it. So, okay, let's start. Ready? So basically, um, Veronica, you put yourself on mute like five seconds ago. Apologize. So uh, basically, the first lesson that I would like to start with is ask questions at the start of your career. And this is super important one. That's why I put it first. So why it is important? When you're just starting some project or your career path, usually you don't know much, right? Uh, you don't know much about the profession, the project itself. You don't know uh, who the stakeholders are. So this is the right time to ask as many questions as possible. So uh, I think it's the most productive way to get all the information. You ask questions, you get the answers right away. Right, so don't be hesitant to ask many, many questions. And there is Chinese proverb that says, um, who asks a question remains a fool for five minutes. He who does not ask remain a fool forever. It's very hard to disagree, right? Uh, sometimes you feel uncomfortable asking questions, but it's so fine at the beginning uh, of your career or a project start, right? Um, so you need to understand what is ex expected from you exactly. Sometimes I face those situations when uh, people come to the office, um, they sit somewhere next to the manager, manager gives a task, leaves a person for one, two, three days, right? And the person is kind of working on this task. There is no communication. In the end, after three days, we figure out that this, you know, the work that you deliver is not exactly the work the manager expects you to uh, complete. And I have very painful experience uh, when I was an intern in one of the companies and um, it was very similar situation. I was doing my work. I didn't know much about testing. I was four year, fourth year student and I tried my best, right? But in the end, um, they said that, hey, you don't ask many questions and um, you didn't uh, deliver the right uh, quality of the product, right? Because I didn't create the right test cases. I didn't find all the bugs. And again, the most important thing is that I didn't align the expectations and I didn't clarify what is needed. 
right? And also what is very important is that nowadays uh, people are hiring um, you not because of your hard skills, even though it might seem so, right? You come to the interview and there are a lot of technical questions, but mainly those questions I am to understand how fast you learn, how quickly you adapt, you know, how many technologies you know from the start. But what is really kind of um, groundbreaker at this point is um, your soft skill set, right? Because you will be changing projects. You will never know with the same technology over and over again. Most probably there will be some additional uh, pieces that you will need to learn. Therefore, soft skills are super important, right? Uh, your adaptivity and flexibility. And what is more important uh, is by asking questions, even during the interview, right? You have an opportunity to ask questions about your assignment, about the company and, and such, right? It will help you to show your interest, your engagement, your passion, and this is what is really uh, valued on the market. So the best way to ask the questions is coming to a person, kind of in-person communication, right? Uh, you ask person a question and you have a great opportunity to follow up right away. You also understand some context information. You know the person is happy, if he's busy, if he's irritated, or on the contrary, he's eager to talk to you for another hour or two and explain everything, right? So this is really great. Another thing is to have something documented for reference. In this case, I would suggest using emails. So basically you ask a question in the email, you get a response, you have a solid documentation that this is how it should be done and you did according to this, right? So those are fantastic two ways of getting the information. But I might warn you about one thing. Don't ask the same question twice. Just be smart in asking questions, right? And I think it goes without saying. OK, this was point number one. I think uh, we can switch to number two, which is extremely important. I would put it like in red, right? Um, and it says build solid relationship with people around you. Your relationship with people is super important. Building your network helps you to grow. Building your network will help you to understand what the opportunities are around you. So I can give you two examples here. Uh, when I first started working as a junior test engineer, um, my task was to shadow other people. Basically, I worked in pairs with different specialists to get to know about functional tests and to get to know about performance tests and to know what regression is, uh, to know what is uh, UI and, and such, right? And at some point I was paired with Andrew. Uh, this was, um, an engineer that was high a couple of levels higher than I and it was my probation period. So it was very important for me to, you know, uh, to have my career going, right? And I understood that something was wrong with my communication uh, with Andrew. I didn't know what exactly, right? But he didn't seem to be, you know, very friendly. He just gave instructions. And further, I realized that uh, my manager was saying that something is wrong, right? I need to correct something, but I didn't know what exactly, right? So what I did uh, during one of the company events or during team building, I don't know exactly, but basically what we did, we went for drinks and had a nice friendly conversation, right? Uh, so we discussed some, you know, personal things like, you know, passion, hobbies. We discussed career path. We get to know about personal traits and such. And it was really exciting, warm conversation. And, you know, it was kind of a nice breaker. Um, and after that, my relationship with Andrew changed dramatically. So he was no longer this cold boss, uh, icy one, right? The one that I feared. And uh, my work uh, was really easier because he was not kind of a boss anymore giving instructions. He was like more like a man mentor, giving some kind of guidance, pieces of advice, encouraging to do something. And uh, moreover, he became my best friend. This is very valuable lesson, right? Maybe nothing has changed in terms of like uh, the work that I did, 
Well, I believe it it, it kind of approved because uh, of the guidance that I got from him, right? But uh, what is more important is how other person treats you and what are the relationships. Let me give you another example. I participated in one of the conferences in New York where you have all the stars coming um, on scene. So basically there was Sir Richard Branson, uh, there was Bloomberg, uh, there was creator of Wikipedia, there was Kawasaki and you know all the guys. So basically people come to the conference just to listen to the talks and get to know something. But this is not the main reason why, uh, let's say, Americans come to the conferences, right? For them, conferences is a nice occasion to get to know other people, and it's more about communication. So what happened? I was sitting, and next to me uh, there was an English, an Indian, a woman entrepreneur. So. First of all, she reached out to me and asked uh, if I have a program of the event and she asks a couple of questions. Later, she kind of showed her business card, introduced herself, talked about her business to me, right? So this is kind of very nice opportunity to promote your business. And I could. Obviously, I was not really, you know, the person who can help her at that time, but I could potentially be her investor or I could be a business partner or I could be someone who will change the whole universe for her, right? So this is really, really important, you know, to use any opportunity you can to build your network and to get in touch with people, to promote your business, to promote your image um, and, you know, um, to build a solid network of information exchange. I know that some people will say, hey, it's not very easy, right? I can't be like this Indian woman entrepreneur. I can't reach to anybody. I'm introvert. I completely understand, you know, uh, it's not easy to reach out to other people, right? Um, but this is something that everybody should work on, right? And there is a fantastic book I would like to share with you. This is uh, the book on the slides uh, that says never eat alone. Basically, it says even like routine tasks should be wasted, right? Shouldn't be wasted. So don't spend time just eating. Try to eat and, you know, have a conversation with other people and establish relationship. Fantastic book. I highly encourage you. Hopefully it will change your perspective and make it easier for you uh, to build relationship. This was number two. OK. Let's dive into number three. So number three from my perspective is also very important. So it says automate what should be automated. You know, with we deal with automation every day. Basically, if you have a washer or you have a dryer or something um, and they help you to save time because obviously time is the most precious resource that you can uh, share with other people, right? And you can use for your benefit. And obviously as an engineer, I'm not even speaking about test automation engineers, right? I'm speaking about test engineers in general, right? Um, you have a lot of tasks. Some of them are very routine, like running regression or checking logs, you know? And it's really good to think how you can automate those tasks, right? And what I encourage you to do is to identify those tasks that you kind of hate doing, that you do every day, and maybe the computer will be more productive in doing that. So once you understand the problem, uh, you basically try to solve it, right? So let's talk about checking logs. I believe that each uh, test engineer should know where the logs are and should be able to check it. Why? And I know a lot of people are not, not doing that, right? So um, I believe it's very important because logs are the fastest way to identify any potential problems. You know, any errors or warnings you will see right away. This is the cheapest way. Um, instead of do, going to the application, clicking the buttons and checking how it behaves, sometimes uh, you can see the errors just on application start, right? And those are crucial. And um, ideally, uh, you have more than one instance of your application, more than one server, so checking logs becomes really painful. What is more important, you need to check logs all the time. Why is that? I believe that as test engineer, you need to own the quality of the application. 
So basically, you need to be the person who knows uh, the application and you know the status of application at any given point of time. So imagine you're sitting on your at your computer and there is a phone call from your boss. Hello, let's say, uh, hello, Caitlin, how are you doing? So basically we have a bug in production and this is kind of a very critical one and we would like to fix it right away. Do we have this bug in the new version? Is this new version ready to be shipped to the production right away? So there is nothing like, you know, we can wait one hour or, you know, we can wait a couple of days until we have it all finalized, right? You need to know the status of the application and at any given point of time, which is like, um, what is more important, you can also kind of keep everyone informed, right? So kind of send in alerts, send in notification emails, but let's leave it for now, right? So if you have a couple of instances and um, you have a couple of uh, servers, it becomes very difficult to check all the logs all the time, right? Therefore, I suggest automating this activity, right? Um, and there are a lot of tools very useful in the industry, and this is just, you know, those tools, just suggestions, right? There might be better tools. So the first one I suggest to use is Splunk. So this is an easy way to specify the machine, uh, let's say the server where you get the logs from, and then some pardon, and then time period for which you want to get the logs. And then Splunk can um, generate email alerts, right? The second tool is more sophisticated one. It's called the stream sets, um, even though it works like a puzzle. You know, so this uh, tool works for Linux mostly and Linux based operation systems. So what it does is basically uh, it has all the solutions ready for you. So basically it's kind of drag and drop. So you get some piece of functionality. Let's say go to the server. You just need to specify which server, then connect to the database. You need to specify just database details, uh, then filter out something, right? So this is just kind of drag and drop tool. Anyone can master it and uh, it will help you to create kind of streamline of events, stream set of events, where you specify the details, go there, grab there, uh, grab this information and send it somewhere. So highly encouraged to, you know, to learn uh, some of those tools and uh, to know what is trending on the market, right? There are a lot of tools that you probably already are working with, like Jira, and uh, there are different plugins like X-Ray, that will allow you to upload your results, which are also kind of important. This is also kind of super time consuming when you have a regression set and then you need to ideally attach those regression results to the tickets itself just to prove that it has been tested, right? So this plugin could be really great to use. And then there are a couple of other things, very trendy technologies like Elasticsearch and Kibana, uh, where you basically put your data somewhere and then execute different operations, build dashboards with Kibana. So this is something that can also help you to grow and uh, to use your time more efficient. And obviously, you know, um, everybody expects that you're super efficient, right? So to be efficient, you need to use your time in a smart way. So this was about number three. And uh, just to summarize uh, what we just said. So this is the quote from Bill Gates. He said the first rule of any technology used in business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. But you, if you apply the automation to an efficient operation, it will magnify the inefficiency. So I would encourage you to think if you are doing the right things, right? And automate in a smart way. The title of this slide says automate what should be automated. Not necessarily everything, just, you know, approach this in a very smart way and careful one. Okay, let's move forward. So the next one is build effective work relationship with customer. So we talked about relationship in general. Let's talk about customer relationships, how they are different. Right here on the slide, you can see Chiburashka on the one hand, and you have a bossy face who is also always smiling, you know, boss is always happy. Um, and you are kind of have different perspective, right? So you are on the different uh, side of the picture. And the picture in the middle is a picture of some military base. Um, funny as that, right? So this military base uh, shows the alignment. 
it shows the alignment of the aircrafts in here. So what you need to do, you need to manage customer expectations and kind of align your expectations and your work with what customer wants you to do, right? So customer is your boss. Usually it could be, you know, project stakeholder. It could be client external one. So any kind of stakeholder you're working for. So you need to understand what this person wants. So any person comes to a software company or a software team to have some pain uh, being eased and somehow, you know, fixed. There is some problem and you need to help the customer with that, right? So you need to understand the problem and you also need to provide some kind of solution. Right. Sometimes it's very painful. I know a lot of people kind of in the QA industry are kind of perfectionists, so they want everything to be done perfectly. Right. Let's say spin the product with zero defects. Right. Um, that's that. That's great. Right. Uh, this feeling of perfectionists perfectionism is great, but on the other hand, customer might have different expectations, uh, might have different resource constraints, time constraints, and sometimes it's not exactly what he wants, right? Maybe it is just shipping the product as MVP, minimum value product, right? He doesn't care about minor defects and it, it hurts, right? It hurts your feeling because you feel it should be done perfectly, right? But please remember that um, even though it's painful, your main role is uh, basically to, to deliver some quality and to align your work with the customer expectations. So what you can do just to ease this pain that you have inside you that something is not perfect is please provide all the information to the customer that you have. So basically, if you have uh, any opinion on how the product should look like, any status on the open bugs and, uh, and such, right? What you need to do is to gather this information and to provide it to the customer, right? And then customer, let him take the final call and uh, make final decision. So uh, he will be when well informed and he will be the final decision maker. OK. I think uh, this is pretty much clear. OK, let's have, you know, two seconds of relaxation. Inhale, exhale. It's kind of a long talk, right? I understand we are somewhere in the middle. OK, so the next one that I have is always get familiar with architecture. And um, this is very important, right? I know that many people will say that uh, getting familiar with architecture is, you know, not um, your responsibility as such, right? Um, but it's not completely true, right? So code can tell you much, but not all, right? What is more important is um, how components are integrated together. Usually uh, we know that the defects are clustered and they are clustered uh, somewhere in the system and mostly it's somewhere on the boundaries of the components. When one component expects uh, one data input and, and it doesn't get it, right? So it's super important to understand what are the boundaries, what are the communication protocols, uh, how the data is passed, and uh, you know, at some point you will realize that you need to be somewhere in between the components. So you need to be some kind of interceptor, a uh, person who will be standing between the components and getting those messages, checking them, uh, making sure they're consistent, or even sometimes uh, you will have to replace those messages with a fake one to check, you know, how the application behaves in a negative scenario. And to be able to intercept those events, uh, you need to understand how the system works in general. Right, and it's also applicable for the fault tolerance events. Let's say your application works in the data with the database, and at some point, the database disconnects. Do you know exactly how it will affect your application? So maybe it's worth testing, putting some proxy in between your application and the database to be able to switch down um, the database. Well, basically, you know, the industry standard is not kind of switching out databases because many people are using them. That's why we're kind of imitating switching out databases. That's why the more skillful you are in terms of like technical deep knowledge skills, um, the best you can deal with such kind of situations. Also, when you get familiar with architecture on the project, 
Uh, it will help you understand how the system works, what kind of tests uh, you should write, uh, what are the scope of your test in general, right? If you forget about some of the components, it's a big deal, right? So I highly encourage if you just join some project, uh, ask for project documentation, right? Uh, make sure you understand how the system works and uh, make sure you understand um, what are the uh, components in the system and how they communicate together. And also when you get this knowledge and basically are more familiar with architecture patterns and such, you can come to the other project and say, hey, you know, I, I worked on the other project and they had more efficient architecture. They handled it this way or that way. It's also helpful during performance testing, right? You need to understand um, what are the bottlenecks of the system? Uh, is it any component? Is it specific area in the component? So it's really crucial and I highly encourage you to get to know and this is uh, the book uh, that I highly recommend for reading and this is the one that Software Solution School um, in uh, EPAM refers to. Uh, this is called Software Architecture in Practice. This is the book you can start with to understand. It's also very helpful to understand, you know, design patterns in general, especially if you're a test automation engineer, this is a must to know. Uh, design patterns, how we build the systems, you know, what are the common practices? Right, so um, this is number five. Let's move on. <clears throat> the next one, uh, number six, talks about um, non-functional requirements. And in general, about the requirements that haven't been mentioned to you. Sometimes, you know, we deal with situations when we get a lot of uh, requirements in terms of like, um, let's say positive test environments, right? Something positive, how the system should behave, but um, business uh, product owner or business people, they miss the requirements, how the system shouldn't behave. What happens if, if some event is triggered, right? We don't want to praise, uh, print the stack trace to the end user. We don't want to reveal any internal details from security perspective wise, right? So in general, we need to talk about um, requirements that were not defined in here. So let's speak about uh, non-functional requirements and such, right? So something that uh, might uh, deal with uh, other aspects, right? So let's imagine that you have a new product that is being released to production, right? It's absolutely brand new and you want to ensure that everything is fine. So here's the checklist. And uh, what I want you to understand uh, is basically that when you deal with the requirements and tests in general, you should have a systematic like system approach, right? You need to understand the problem from various angles. You're not just responsible for functional testing and it's super important to understand this. You know, imagine that um, development team was working on the uh, software product for six, seven months. Uh, they released it to production and the system failed only because let's say um, it was producing logs and logs were so huge that they add all the space on the box, right? Application crashed. No one cares whether it's a functional, non-functional issue, or maybe it was some kind of uh, problem in the hardware, you know. It's you own the product. You need to be responsible that when it goes to production, um, it will be functioning okay, right? And whatever it takes, you need to do it, right? So here is kind of, you know, just an example of some kind of system thinking. So when you move first to production, you need to ensure that uh, the right hardware is there, right? Um, is it enough to handle project load? So do you have enough servers? Uh, do they have uh, enough CPU memory and such, right? What is the operation system uh, is used? Um, and uh, is it compatible with the application components, right? Is it the same operation system or sometimes usually, you know, it's more like a version of the operation system that you used to work with and you used to test on? This is super important, right? Because your test might not be valid. Do you have all the dependencies deployed on the server? Let's say it's just simple like that, like Java, some database drivers, Kafka. Um, has it on build set up correctly? So compatible versions, um, you know, proper directories, proper settings. So yeah, it becomes complicated. It's really kind of low level thinking. But think about, you know, uh, think about the waitress 
in the cafe or a restaurant. You come to the uh, restaurant and you have some expectations. You expect her to be nice, to be understanding, to bring the money on time, to bill, uh, to bill you on time, you know, to bring the check, not to wait. Uh, you expect her to know the dishes and such. So if you think about any profession, it gets really complicated when you do it the right way. So here is the same thing here. So um, just a couple of more items left. So uh, let's speak about the application that is already deployed. So what is the version that we deployed? Is it the right one? Does it have all the features that we wanted to include and we want to, to the user to use? And OK, let's say everything is fine. The version is right. All the feature set is there. So application started in prod. No, it's still not the end of you know the show. Your work is still not done. So you need to check uh, what is the load. You know, um, can the application handle all this load? Uh, what do logs show? Do they have any errors or something? What is the CPU usage, right? Um, and such. What is the log rotation policy? So this is uh, something really important, right? Uh, to understand and uh, something that you should ask questions about. So not just functional requirements that have been specified, but all the bunch of related things, everything that will help you to ship reliable and quality product production. And remember, you are the owner of the application and you need to know the status of the application at any given point of time. OK. Now we are good to move to point number seven, which is question all the information. So in the current era, we have tons of information coming from different sources, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's really important uh, to make sure it's the right. So here is a quotation I would like to share with you. So writing system software is like planning a family. If you make a mistake, you have to live with it for 20 years. It's, it's really true like that because sometimes you have those legacy systems that work for 10, 15, 20 years and any problem that was initially not questioned uh, could potentially be you know, a problem for a long, long time. So what I suggest to do is as a test engineer, you know, pay attention to the requirements in the first place, right? Um, you know uh, the life cycle of the software. So at the beginning, we're working on the requirements and this is uh, the part where you need to jump in. If you ask questions of the requirements phase, uh, you are able to save a lot of time after that. You know, developers hasn't started development. Uh, you haven't set up infrastructure and such, right? So you can save a lot of time and money and become really valuable specialist uh, because you already kind of save uh, some sum, right? So it's really important to question all the requirements, make sure all negative and positive scenarios are specified. You understand how the system works. Uh, you feel that it's kind of aligned with the general business strategy of the company, right? You know, most of the companies um, want to get profit. Uh, obviously, selling something for negative prices doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, so tr try to kind of find any logical problems and uh, make sure you have up to date information. You know, all the information that we see on the Confluence or elsewhere, um, it could be up to, uh, not up to date. So make sure it's up to date and ensure the people you ask are the actual stakeholders. On my project, we lost kind of a couple of months because we worked on the design provided by the product owner. And that's what you usually do, right? Oh, that's what people usually do. They rely on product owner. He knows all the details. But for us, it was a mistake, right? We went into the wrong direction. And it's kind of disaster for the project itself, right? So make sure you ask the right stakeholders. Maybe it for us, it made sense to talk to the manager, right? And, um, you know, make sure um, we have uh, the final requirement. So as much as this, OK, let's move on. Be able to find answers yourself, right? At the beginning, I said ask as many questions as you can. Unfortunately, it doesn't hold true on slide number eight. Uh, because at this point you're kind of mature enough, right? Uh, you know a lot of about a lot about testing. You know how it works. You know the expectations. So at this point you need to be kind of self-sufficient. You need to be able to find answers yourself, and this is super important. You know when you ask the question, you have obviously kind of put some responsibility on the other person, right? You are 
spending his time and um, even though it's very efficient way, uh, there are better ways. Uh, what I suggest to do is before asking any question, uh, basically try to find answer yourself. And it's, it's really valuable. So imagine you write an email. So when you write an email, you need to define a problem. You need to like kind of your question will be kind of uh, definition of the problem. Then most probably you need to describe the context, some kind of problem background, why this occurred and uh, what are the, you know, uh, the contextual information, what is the situation, right? And then what I suggest to do is basically provide uh, some kind of possible solutions for the stakeholder. And also it's good to prioritize those solutions. Let's say you would say that um, preferably we should implement option number one because it has certain benefits like that, right? And you did huge work. Everybody can see it. You analyzed the problem. You suggested solutions. You provided all the information in terms of like what is more preferable for the system because you know the system, right? And and then um, you know. Sometimes you will get the answer right away. So after you do your due diligence, uh, you understand, hey, um, there is no question here. Basically, this is how it should work. But uh, if you are still like kind of, you know, it, it's better to verify that it works this way and this is the requirement, right? You ask, answer the question, ask the question, and the stakeholder comes back with the answer. And it doesn't go like back and forth, back and forth, because basically you provided all the information, you gave some solutions, you gave background information. So the second email should suffice. He will say A, option A, or option one, right? Uh, and you move forward. Other way it will be different, like because he will not know, you know, he will suggest this, and you will come back with additional information saying, hey, maybe not this because it has some negative impact, right? So it's kind of endless uh, process at this point. So try to find answers yourself. Make sure you understand the contextual information and make sure you do your part of work, right? And those are kind of, you know, some suggestions where you can find this information. And what is really kind of maybe for you frustrating is industry standards. Fantastic way um, applied to everyone, right? Uh, great way to find the information. OK, and I think this is my favorite one. Uh, don't ask developers how to test. You know, I've been working on a project uh, where people are coming and saying, hey, Mike, if you want us to test this, and Mike is a developer, if you want us to test this, please provide us this information or that, right? So it's a kind of, you know, asking uh, if we need to test it, right? And um, another thing is basically um, developer comes to the stand up you discuss in some story and developer says, hey, I've tested it, we can close it. So it's another point, right? This is the same one that probably dis discussed in here um, on this conversation on the slide, right? So you are responsible for the quality of the application as a test engineer, right? So don't ask developers how to test. First of all, uh, they are not test professionals. Trust me, they know little about methodologies of testing. You know, those things like um, equivalence partition and boundary values analysis. Uh, by the way, if you don't know about it, you should also read <laughs> ISTQB uh, preparation guide at least. Um, so all those techniques that help to reduce input data to some uh, very valuable input that can identify the defects, right? So asking developers is not really great. And also they are kind of biased, you know, it's as if coming to the person who sells umbrellas and asking, you know, is it going to rain in the next couple of days? Right? Uh, so try to understand that when developer basically ships the product into the development integration environment, he thinks that it's completely ready. Otherwise, he wouldn't do that, right? So from his perspective, it's um, it doesn't have any bugs or defects or anything. So this person is biased and he's, um, you know, he loves what he did. Uh, he's, let's say, morally attached to the code and he's absolutely sure everything's fine, right? And you are the one who needs to kind of break, create, um, create problems, break the software, ask questions, right? You have a little bit different set of mind, I think. 
I highly encourage you to use developers in terms of like getting more information. Let's say about technical implementation of particular feature, right? Um, or maybe you can use some scripts development team has, right? That will help you to make your work more efficient. You can also ask questions in terms of like, you know, what's the best way to test it, right? Uh, this is what you can do. At least I suggest you to do this, right? Uh, but never ask developers how to test, what to test, right? Just just don't be lost, right? It's it's area of your responsibility. And if you don't know, maybe you need to review architecture requirements and you know and testing theory in general. So this is my suggestion for number nine. And here we go. We have number 10, the last one. So the last one says look into the application code. Right? Uh, and um, I would say that code is not just a code in the code base. So code can reveal secrets. It can show you how good or bad the writing style is. Uh, let's say we are talking about patterns, design patterns. We are talking about the coding principles in general and you know the logic, how a developer thinks. And also if you have a look at the pull request, uh, you will also understand, you know, other comments. Let's say other developers and managers are commenting on this code, so you get an idea how, you know, how this code works and what is the quality of this code, right? Also, even if you are not familiar with any programming language, you can still open pull request and you can still see, you know, the name of the classes. So this way you will be able to see what features has been uh, have been affected basically, right? So to understand where the problem is, what should be tested. Sometimes just looking at the name, you will understand uh, what should be tested, what kind of piece of functionality, right? And also uh, I put here um, test and pyramid. I think this is super important for test engineers. So basically, if you look at the test and pyramid, at the base of the pyramid, you have unit test level. Ideally, it should take 7%, 70% of all tests should be unit tests. Then 20% tests should be service API level tests, and then 10% of UI. And the reasons are right on the picture. Uh, how fast is to execute the tests and how expensive unit tests are fast. They check particular modules only and uh, they are cheap to execute because they can be run on, on development machine. You don't need to promote the code. You don't need to set up integration between the components. So and if you have a broken basis of this pyramid, let's say uh, the developers haven't co covered the application. What will be the benefit of your test like service and UI level? In a deal world, they are just 30%, right? And also the foundation is broken. So what I suggest to do to check unit test coverage, you're not responsible for unit tests. You're just responsible maybe for encouraging developers to track these statistics and bring it to the manager. And uh, let's say there are a lot of plugins like Jococo that will give an idea on the test coverage to make sure that test and pyramid holds true. Right, uh, the foundation is not broken and you are building your framework on the solid uh, background, on the solid foundation. I also encourage you to participate in code reviews to get to more, more like exposure to the code and how it works and also maybe learn some programming language. It never hurts, right? Even if you are not into automation or anything, right? It just helps you to create some neuron connections in your brain and you know uh, always learn something new and this is really uh, something that we all should do. And this was number 10. I believe I should uh, wrap up um, my talk and um, I believe um, this information is somehow useful to you and those were the lessons I've learned during my 10 years of career and I believe that your way to success, it doesn't have to be painful. So try to find some mentors, try to follow people and learn from uh, mistakes of other people. That's what I encourage you to do. Thank you very much and please grow fast. Everyone is so much, you know, uh, involved into your growth, your company, your family, and everybody wants you to grow as fast as you can. Thank you very much, guys, for staying with us. Thank you, Veronica. That was really great talk. Uh, just have a deep breath and give yourself a couple seconds to recoup after 
for that long session and we have a lot of questions, like wow. really a lot of questions. So <laughs> let me start with the first one uh, that uh, Irina put. So it sounds like this. So how do you think uh, a person could get a job at KA if you don't have like any experience? Would just online courses be enough or should you just, you know, or should you choose another path or something like this? So how right. do you start? Definitely, that's a great question. You know, everybody started at some point, right? Um, I can share um, um, how, what is my experience, right? Basically, um, you can't start something you don't understand, right? You need to know what are the expectations from this career path, right? You need to know career growth, you know? Um, so you need to understand if it's something that you will feel comfortable in. So this is the first thing. So how you can get to know it? I would suggest to read uh, some requirements. So basically go to the job sites and check the requirements. What are the requirements for this position and see, you know, how, how comfortable you are in that, right? Also, there is a lot of kind of literature in terms of like what is uh, de fact, what is, you know, some theory should be there. So what I encourage you to do if you just start in this career path, uh, there is ISTQB certification. This is certification for the testing professionals. You don't have to take the whole test, uh, even though it will benefit your career, right? You can uh, have it without any experience. So basically uh, having some preparation materials and there are syllabus online available. So basically you try to download the syllabus. It's like 60, 90 pages and you go over it four times. Maybe you read it, right? And you understand the testing theory, you understand the background, how testing is done, and you will be able to answer uh, most of the questions during the technical interview. Then what is more important is to get exposure to some tools and you need to understand what you want to do. In, in testing, you have a lot of paths to go, right? You can uh, choose mobile testing, security testing. You need to, you, you can go into uh, user interface testing and such, right? So try to identify what would you like to do because those will be the questions, your um, technical area, and try to get to know some tools in this area, right? Um, this is my suggestion. And I believe, yes, um, people, there are no universities uh, that prepare test engineers, right? Uh, they just give some computer IT background, right? So you can really start this career from the very beginning without any prior knowledge. Uh, I just suggest, you know, to do your due diligence on uh, what should be done, what testing tools you need to know for that, what is the area, is it for you or not? And there are some testing courses I can also uh, recommend, but mostly those are kind of testing schools online. But most of the theory is in the syllabus already, ISTQB syllabus. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a really great comment. I think that Irina uh, got her answer and she has another question for you. So uh, let's say that uh, you are starting an engineer and you would like to motivate a colleague to be a mentor. So any ideas how to do this? <laughs> this is in general, right? Uh, this is more a kind of generic question. How to motivate a person to become a mentor? Um, I need, I think like um, it's more like um, a call, right? So someone who has something to share and it's passionate about uh, sharing something can become a mentor. Not everyone, right? There are some people who are not really passionate about what they're doing and uh, they don't want to encourage other people doing it, right? So if you want to encourage someone to become a mentor, let's say, if I understand your question correct, right? Uh, you need to uh, kind of talk to this person and uh, let the person understand what is special about this person, that he's knowledgeable, that he's easygoing, that he's like, you know, uh, really the soul of the company, let's say, um, and those uh, will help you to understand how he's different from others. And at this point, he can realize that he can give something from his experience to, to others, right? This is what I feel, at least. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, another question that will be from Wendy. Uh, the question sounds like, uh, may I have your advice on how to explore and gain experience with type of testing I have never performed in the past? Right. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for the question. Uh, basically, uh, the thing is that we always have to do something new, right? So, for example, I was working as a functional test engineer, then I got into automation, then into performance testing. So, uh, 
to get exposed to this, uh, you need to know what are the best practices in this. Uh, I found the problem that if you go to YouTube videos or uh, you go uh, to the articles on the Internet, uh, you will have a basic understand how it is done, but the problem is that it's not the best way sometimes. It's just, you know, some people who are, let's say, um, I don't want to offend anyone, but if you are in QA one year and you start uh, teaching people, right, um, uh, this is something that you don't have enough experience, let's say, right? And we see a lot of, you know, going on on YouTube, let's say, right? People just want to talk, so they kind of uh, record the videos. Uh, they just learned how to do it and they're sharing, right? So what I uh, recommend to do is to go to some sources which are more kind of, um, you know, arrow prone, uh, you know, arrow proof. So you have more um certainty that it works so uh there are some uh, book series like edison wesley right or some some other uh book series that are kind of um you can get confidence that this is industry standards right so there are some courses uh on different platforms uh let's say safari books or um linkedin they're more you know um they can better explain the whole thing rather than uh listen to youtube videos right um so this is kind of my suggestion. It's very kind of tricky to do it yourself, right? In terms of like sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, so it, it's really easy, easier to find some mentor in this area. The person who can show you, hey, you need to learn this and this and that to be kind of um, performance tester. But also what is more important, uh, just one thing from my career perspective. Um, I went to Poland as manual test engineer. I was hired and I got to know that uh, this is automation position. So we're shocked automation position. Come on. So I had to learn automation in a um, couple of weeks. Those weeks when you kind of onboarded for the project and this is really valuable, right? Because I was trying to, you know, I, I tried learning automation before and I, I kind of never succeeded because I realized I didn't have the right motivation, right? But when I happened to sign the contract and it was my job, right? Um, it was really, really um, you know, helpful. So uh, if you learn something, try to make sure you have kind of something that will um, create artificial boundaries, like you have some kind of time pressure or you give a talk in a couple of days to other people, right? Uh, something that will put pressure on you and, uh, you know, help you to work more efficiently. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And you basically touched another question that was sent by one of our viewers, which sounds like how to become an expert in test automation if persons have on the manual testing experience. So could you elaborate on this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so you need to understand what is kind of uh, trendy uh, or what will hold true for another five years, let's say in your career and uh, choose the technology that you will work with. So there are different directions. So it's uh, mobile automation, it's front end automation like Selenium, right? And there is back end automation. So what I would suggest is um, to uh, learn some programming language first. So you don't, um, you can't automate without knowing programming language. So I suggest uh, going to maybe Python direction because Python is something that is easier to learn. Uh, there are plenty of cor uh, courses on Udacity or Coursera where you can learn Python or maybe Java, right? Java is a little bit more complicated. Um, but still holds true and after you get to know the foundations of the program language you're able to create some kind of basics uh, program so you need to learn something that uh, some specific tools right uh, for automation let's say if it's front end so uh, you can use selenium right uh, so you integrate uh, selenium and let's say python or java right and then you build something on top of that but first of all you know try to learn programming language um, and uh, this is my advice Thank you. I agree with you. It's really valuable advice. So the next question will be a little bit like personal. Uh, it seems like you have really extensive experience and that's great. And what is the latest les lesson learned for you? You know, uh, the latest lesson learned is keep all your information in cloud. <laughs> so this is a hard lesson I've learned today, losing my presentation for today. Um, and uh, we try to learn every day, so 
right now, basically, um, for me, I'm, I'm learning something in uh, software architecture and in cloud area. So again, um, I tried to put tight deadlines. So what I did, I just signed in for the course um, and then I have to you know, finish it uh, within one uh, month. This is the way how I work. Um, so this is something that, you know, in terms of like, you know, hard skills lesson, let's say. And one of the soft skill lessons may be that I can talk for more than one hour nonstop. <laughs> and this is this is lesson kind of self discovery uh, for me. OK, great, thank you. That's really interesting. And I definitely agree with you regarding the keep everything in cloud. I do the same. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. OK, and uh, the next question will be from Jana. I, I really hope that I pronounce it correctly. Sorry if I'm not. So the question will be like, uh, do you have any experience with LinkEA? And uh, in your opinion, how could uh, we adapt daily processes for LinkEA? If you have an experience. No, we don't have an experience. I'm sorry. OK, OK, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, what is the percentage of unit tests on project that you are currently working on? Uh, well, guys, I'm currently working um, on various projects and uh, mostly I'm kind of a uh, technical manager right now, uh, but uh, it depends on the you know diligence of the uh, developers. So there were projects where we had just a couple of tests, right? Um, and nowadays uh, I have projects where we have around 70%. So having 100% of unit tests is just a fiction, right? I also worked with the students where we covered some functionality like calculator with 100% of unit tests, and those might be also not available, right? Even though you have coverage, uh, you don't have, you know, uh, the tests are not really effective. Right, so numbers are numbers, actual tests, uh, and uh, what they have inside is, is something different, right? So the first advice is, yeah, first look at the numbers, and the second advice, look at the quality of those tests. But I think something reasonable to have is like 80% um, of coverage. Um, let's say we have some kind of JSON parsing feature and we have more than uh, 800 uh, tests right now, unit tests. Pretty, you know, impressive. Yeah, it really is. I agree with you. So thank you, Alexander, for question and thank you, Nico, for that answer. And we have two more questions that uh, that's the only two questions and I really hope that we can answer them just before our time runs out. Sure. So what will be uh, uh, your opinion on on that? Like uh, developer insist on testing something with his approach and uh, he has a full support of management side from client probably. So how would you tackle that situation? OK, so this is more like a question of the ownership, right? So developer is saying that he tested himself, right? Um, and um, it, it's not you, right? Um, if I get the question right. So what I suggest to do, you know, we are not kind of competing, right? What we do like uh, as test engineers, we're responsible for the final quality, right? And also in agile, we're wearing multiple hats. Right, so you can sometimes wear ahead of the developer and developer can uh, wear ahead of tester if testing team is too overloaded. What I suggest to do is not to create a conflict. This is some person that is actually helping you, right? Uh, what you need to do, uh, you need to kind of, I would suggest revise the work, right? Um, so basically see uh, what's testing is being done. Uh, if you have any suggestions and recommendations. No one would say, you know, if you, kind of analyze the work and suggest solutions how to do it better. I, I don't think any like, uh, management or development team will be against that, right? So your idea is to create a perfect testing. So um, I, I wouldn't like, you know, argue about the ownership of this particular case, right? Maybe he can, uh, he has more tools uh, that he can leverage to test it. I would suggest that as you are responsible for the final quality of application, have it all tracked, you know, in terms of like understand what he's doing, uh, try to enhance the process, gather the statistics, right? So kind of try to shadow it. And also once this done, try to get this tool from him, right? If he, it was a script or framework, try to, you know, kind of inherit so you can use it uh, for future. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you once again for your time, for sharing the experience. It was really great and I do believe that your journey for past 10 years, it was great and uh, a lot of interesting things that you can share with us and with, with others. Uh, thank you also for our great audience and for your great questions. Uh, that was our last presentation for today and we will hope to see you tomorrow in our other sessions. Uh, don't forget to go to Community Z website and uh, uh, look into the schedule. Uh, have a nice time everybody, have a nice day and uh, see you tomorrow I hope. Bye bye. Thank you guys, thank you, have a great day, bye.